would like to express my thanks again to uh, the pastors or whoever was in charge of inviting me. I've always, since I got to know Dr. Waters through his writings and lectures, I've always appreciated and admired him from afar. And now I got to meet him, and the highlight was that he brought his wife. Got to meet her as well. So uh, thank you for making that uh, happen. I was able to make a new friend. And um, I got to see Vody Bauckham as well. When I first met him several years ago, um, I noticed back then two things different than, than I saw in him today. One was a beard, and the other was gray hair. He had neither when I first met him. And you know, in some third world countries, they call the pastors, the visiting pastors, uncle. I don't know if the kids here used to call him uncle. You can't call him uncle anymore. You have to call him papa, gramps, grandpa, something like that, because he's, and he's looking old. And we all witnessed him not being able to track with his own arguments. That was, that was very sad to see, wasn't it? I, it everybody felt bad for him, right? And then some clown yelled out, getting old in the back. And, but do you notice that helped the, the uh, arm of the record player jump to the right track in his, in his head? So all that to say, I've been asked to approach the subject of Christ as the scope of Scripture. There's a Latin phrase that, uh, that that comes from, uh, scopus scripturae, the scope of the Scriptures. And... Uh, the language of the, scope of the scope of Scripture is actually in our confession, the Westminster Confession and the Baptist Confession at 1.5, the scope of the whole, which is to give all glory to God. But the confession doesn't tease, tease out the answer to this question. Well, how does God uh, get glory for himself if the scope of the whole of the Scripture is the glory of God? What does the Bible teach in terms of God, uh, in the language of probably Thomas Watson, fetching and finding glory for himself? How does God do that? If you get behind the confession and read the literature, they would say God gets glory for himself through what he does in the incarnate Son of God who became one of us for us and for our salvation to bring his elect, to bring elect sinners to a state of, uh, uh, of existence never before experienced by anybody except the last Adam upon his resurrection and ascension in, into glory. He, the, the Son of God will bring many sons to glory. What's the Bible? What's the New Testament all about? It's about Jesus. What's the Old Testament all about? Ultimately, it's about Jesus. And why do we know that? Because God tells us in his word that ultimately that's what it's about. That the issue of the scope of Scripture, you think of scope, you could think of, well, we're in Texas, so immediately everybody's going, that's on my rifle, you know, I got a scope on my rifle. Um, you could think of scope as something like this, within this sphere, okay, within this scope, there are things that exist. Or you could think of scope as, um, something that is uh, uh, that to which something points, a target, a goal. The older writers viewed scope in, in both senses. Like if they said the scope of this text would be the teaching of this text. If they said the scope of this book, they could mean the target, the goal, the single reason why this book, for instance, exists. And that kind of a, that kind of thinking was, is in the older writers behind the confession, the confession, our confession of faith, and of course the Westminster um, confession as well. Now in um, 1536, the first Helvetic confession reads this way. The first, the, the, this position, excuse me, the position of this entire canonical scripture is this. That God is kind-hearted to the race of men and that he has proclaimed this kindness through Christ Jesus. 
the position of this entire canonical scripture. By the way, that paragraph or that article in the first Helvetic Confession of 1536 is entitled, The Scope of Scripture. So when scope comes into the Westminster family of confessions, it's not uh, de novo, it's not out of the blue, it's not a brand new term, and certainly not a brand new uh, concept embodied by the term. Scope goes back to at least the 16th century. Here, in this statement, Christ is confessed as the revelation of God's kindness to man, and this is the position of the entire canonical scripture. All this to show that uh, over a hundred years before our confession, this concept of scope is being, um, being discussed and confessed here in this First Helvetic Confession. If you go to 1629, a theologian that was highly influential in uh, the First Baptist Confession and the Second, William Ames said this, The Old and New Testaments are reducible to these two primary heads. The Old promises Christ to come, and the new testifies that he has come. I found that very helpful to encapsulate basically what the Christ as the scope of Scripture means. The theological or the interpretive method of the Reformed and the post-Reformation guys started with a text of Scripture and its exegesis. Christ, as the scope of Scripture, was a conclusion from Scripture, not a presupposition brought to it. I hope to show you some of the arguments for that. The Reformed Christocentric interpretation of the Bible was an attempt to apply a principle derived from the Bible, and the principle is Christ as the scope of Scripture. But it was also an application of sola scripturae to the issue of hermeneutics. In other words, they recognized the authority of Scripture in the interpretation, in their interpretation of, of Scripture, by recognizing Christ as the scope of Scripture. And they recognize Christ as the scope of Scripture from the Scripture itself, then interpreting Scripture in light of that scope. So that we could say this, Christ as the scope of Scripture then conditioned all subsequent in scriptural interpretations. So let me try to back up a little and explain that. So if you read the whole Bible, Genesis through Revelation, and you read it according to its divine intent, you'll conclude this. We have the written Word of God not simply because God's the creator, because we have the unwritten book of God, the creation itself, already testifying uh, uh, that God is and that he's powerful and that he's divine. But we have the written word of God, not simply because God's creator and man's creature, and we have the written word of God not simply because man is a creature who's fallen into sin, we have the written word of God, after you read the whole thing, we have a written word of God because God has a plan of redemption that centers on the incarnate Son of God, that centers on the Christ, the especially anointed servant of the Lord promised, as Ames said, in the Old Testament and fulfilled or explained for us in the New Testament. They saw that in Holy Scripture, and they concluded this. If the target, if the aim and the goal is the revelation of the Messiah for the salvation of, of the world then that goal, that scope, that target, that into which the whole tends should condition the interpretation of all its parts. Because if it doesn't, then we're, 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 we're not going to get the parts right. So it was an application of sola scriptura to the issue of interpreting the scriptures. They derived the principle of Christ-centeredness from the Bible itself, and then that conditioned their understanding of Holy Scripture. Now, let's uh, look at two examples of, of this, uh, Christ as the scope of Scripture. John Owen is my first example, and Nehemiah Cox is my second example. John Owen was uh, an, an independent or congregational uh, minister 
Puritan in the 17th century, very instrumental in the Savoy Declaration, which is very much like the Westminster Confession and very much like the Baptist Confession. Um, and there's this debate going on a couple years ago. Some, an Anglican brother said something like this, no, John Owen wasn't a Baptist, assuming some of the contemporary Baptists were trying to make John Owen a Baptist. I can assert this, was John Owen a Baptist? No. Is John Owen a Baptist? Yes. Now, you saw me just look at Dr. Waters. <laughs> He's laughing, just so you know. John Owen says this, The end of the word, he means the written word of God itself, is to instruct us in the knowledge of God in Christ. Notice that word end, the end, the telos, the goal, the termination point of the written word of God is Christ. A few pages later, he says this, Christ is the image of the invisible God, the express image of the person of the Father, and the principal end. He uses that word end, and I think he's using it in a technical sense. What does he mean? He means scope. Uh, the end of the whole scripture, especially of the gospel, is to declare him so to be and how he is so. He discusses, uh, Owen discusses the design, aim, and end of the epistle of the Hebrews. He says this, this end supremely and absolutely is the glory of that God who is the author of it, that is the author of Hebrews, but the end of the scripture, okay, so he went from uh, the, the uh, scope of Hebrews to now the scope of the entire, entirety of, of written revelation, but the end of the scripture is the glory of God in Christ as he hath revealed himself and gathered all things to a head in him unto the manifestation of his glory. As, when the confession says um, the scope of the whole, which is to give all glory to God, it doesn't tease out the answer to the question, well, how does God go about in doing that? But you get the literature behind it, you go, ah, I see. God is going to get glory for himself through what he does in his incarnate son for the salvation of sinners against all enemies and against all odds. He's going to bring many sons to glory. That's the end. That's the terminal point. That's the target. That's the bullseye of written revelation. Christ in his incarnate glory suffering and entering into glory for us. Now, Owen views uh, Genesis 3.15 is very um, important. The seed of the woman shall crush the head of the serpent, uh, given in the motif of, um, of a curse on the serpent, it ends up being a blessing for mankind. Here's what he says um, about Genesis 3.15. This is the very foundation of the faith of the church. And if it be denied, nothing of the economy or dispensation of God towards it from the beginning can be understood. If you don't understand Genesis 3.15 in a messianic or a Christological sense, you're not going to understand the, the rest of the Scriptures properly. The whole doctrine and story of the Old Testament must be rejected as useless, and no foundation be left in the truth of God for the introduction of the new, if we don't understand Genesis 3.15 as a Christological or a messianic promise. So without it, subsequent scripture makes no sense. If you don't take uh, Genesis 3.15 as programmatic for the unfolding of redemptive history, as the seed, the, uh, the seed that ends up into the full acorn or however you use that. That was the Voss analogy. I'm sure Voss got it from somebody else probably too. But uh, if you don't do that, you're going to mess up the Bible. You're going to have salvation by works for a while and then faith. You're going to have all kinds of problems. So uh, Christ, I think, according to John Owen, is the scope of Scripture. And then Nehemiah Cox, very briefly, Nehemiah Cox says some very similar things. So brief that I'll just tell you, if you want to know what he says, you can talk to me later. But it's basically the same thing. Now, um, but my conclusion to these, this uh, Christ as a scope of Scripture from the historical standpoint is this. Uh, this brief survey shows that others before our day and before and during the time of our own confession, others before our day identified the doxological trajectory of Scripture, the scope of the whole which is to give all glory to God, 
they identified the doxological trajectory of Scripture as terminating upon our Lord and His work. The trajectory of Scripture has a terminus, a point toward which everything tends. And this is, by the way, by divine design. That point is the person and work of the mediator, our Lord Jesus Christ. This is a scriptural phenomenon. It comes from Scripture itself. And so in the next uh, section of the lectures, I want to illustrate this from our Lord uh, during His earthly ministry and from some nameless early disciples of uh, of our Lord Jesus Christ. So I'll follow up the historical discussion of Christ as the scope of Scripture with a brief analysis of the same concept. Christ is the terminus. Christ is the bullseye. Christ is the target. Christ is the goal unto which all written revelation serves to reveal Him and His person and His work. I will follow up the historical discussion with a brief analysis of the same thing found in the New Testament. We could do it all over the Scriptures. I'm just going to do it in one passage in the New Testament. And then I'll bring the discussion to, uh, to a conclusion. We'll see that though the phrase, the scope of Scripture, or scopus scripturae, the scope of the Scriptures, uh, has its origins outside of the text of the New Testament, uh, we'll see that the concept embodied in that phrase um, is clear or perspicuous in Holy Scripture. So, my next heading for this lecture is Our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, Our Lord Jesus on Himself as the scope of Scripture. But before I show you that, I want to read a quote by Richard Gaffin. He's commenting on the New Testament's view of the Old Testament as a witness to Christ. I, I'm assuming everybody here has read the New Testament. You know how the New Testament, sometimes uh, the gospel writers, or in the book of Acts, Luke is narrating an event that occurred within their lifetime that they were either, the writers were either eyewitnesses to or they had eyewitness testimony from another. They're writing about um, events that happened. And during the events that, they're, that, that happened, that they're now writing about, the preacher, say Peter, um, is addressing a Jewish audience. And he, he basically, he's saying, what we just experienced, this, the Christ event, the, the incarnation, the sufferings and the glory of Christ, the resurrection and the ascension, is that which the prophets said would take place. There's an old book. I, I think they actually um, might have retitled it. It was called This Is That by F.F. F. Bruce. Do you remember that? You're older than I thought. Uh, they, they've retitled the book. Is it about the New Testament use of the old? Okay. I haven't read the book, but I love the title. This is that. I mean, think about it. That's the way the, the sermons in the book of Acts, when they're preaching, they're telling the Jews, this, what I'm talking about and what we just experienced in our life, life history, the incarnation and sufferings of the glory of Christ, is that which the prophet said would take place. This concept... Uh, is what this quote by Richard Gaffin is getting at. The New Testament's view of the Old Testament as a witness to Christ. Now think about that. The New Testament views the Old Testament as a witness to Christ. Does that mean that the Old Testament became a witness to Christ when the New Testament witnessed it as a, testimony, as a, as a, as a witness to Christ? Did the Old Testament become something it was not when the New Testament was written? <coughs> Excuse me, the correct answer is, I hope, no, right? It's, no. It's, some people look at the Old Testament, New Testament, the relationship that way. The Old Testament had this intent, then Christ came and, and read some, some novel interpretations into it, so you have to give the Old Testament a second read after Jesus comes, and then there's a second meaning for the texts so that the divine intention of the text is twofold, what it meant and now what it means in light of Christ coming. 
Uh, Gaffin's going to deny that in this quote. Listen. He says, For Jesus and the New Testament writers, the Old Testament is one large prophetic and promissory witness to Christ. Excuse me, a diverse but unified witness that centers in his sufferings and consequent glorification. The Old Testament has its overall integrity, its various parts cohere in terms of this death and resurrection fo focus. Put negatively, the Old Testament does not have multiple and discordant trajectories of meaning, but only one. That is, the unidirectional path that leads to Christ, however obscure and difficult it may be for us to follow that path at points along the way. That was a mouthful. I think he's right. Now, probably the most uh, often cited words of our Lord to illustrate his view of himself in, in, uh, in terms of Scripture, Old Testament Scripture for us, occur at the end of Luke's Gospel. Listen, listen to the words. I know you've heard them before. Uh, Luke 24, 25 to 27, and he said to them, O foolish men and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. This, these would be uh, the, the writing prophets of, of the Hebrew scriptures. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? Isn't that interesting? He's, he's telling these disciples, let's think about the Hebrew the scriptures of their day. I'll just call it the Old Testament. It's the Old Testament for us. Don't you realize that it was necessary, according to written revelation, already in place? Before the New Testament, when Jesus said this, the New Testament hadn't been written. You realize Luke's not standing there like Moses wasn't and all that stuff. Luke's writing after the fact. This is already said, spoken. The New Testament didn't exist. All that existed was Moses, the law, and the, uh, the, law the, the, the Psalms, and the prophets. Was it not necessary, based on our Old Testament, for the Christ, the specially anointed servant of the Lord, to suffer these things and to enter into glory? So sufferings and glory is a motif, a twofold motif, not first revealed by John the Baptist, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, or by Jesus in saying this. Jesus is saying that twofold motif of a Messiah, a suffering servant of the Lord, suffering and then entering into glory, um, suffering because of the sins of others, and because he did not sin, I would argue, therefore entering into glory as a reward for his obedience. That's in the Old Testament. By the way, have you ever thought of Romans 3.23 this way? All, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. This is an excursus, so you don't have to pay me for this. Um, but it's connected to this sufferings and glory thing. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Who was the first sinner? Adam. What did he fall short of? The glory of God, whatever that is. Now, when the last Adam comes on the scene, he himself in his earthly ministry says the Old Testament about it is about his sufferings and his entrance into what? Glory. The last Adam didn't sin, did he? He didn't sin. So as a result of not sinning, he gets rewarded for his obedience. That's what's called, I think here, glory. Something interesting is going to happen. Let me stop babbling on that and get over back to the text. Was it not necessary, according to the Old Testament scriptures, for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. And then verse 44, now he said to them, these are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms, that's the threefold canon of, of the Hebrew scriptures, must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and he said to them, thus it is written that the Christ would suffer, by the way, is he quoting the Old Testament now? Thus it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead the third day. He's not quoting the Old Testament verbatim, is he? He's reducing the concepts embedded in the Old Testament in different words by using different words than the Old Testament itself uses. He doesn't fall prey to the word fallacy concept that we talked about last night. But notice what he doesn't say. He doesn't say, thus it is written that the Christ would suffer and enter into his glory. But what do you think entering into his glory means except rising again from the dead the third day? 
Because before that, he, he said sufferings and glory. Now he says sufferings and resurrection. What do you think glory is? It's a state of existence that's better than being a creature, and certainly better than being a creature created in the image of God and fallen. It's what we call, it's what we call glorified state of human nature. I think that's what happened to the incarnate Son of God when he was raised from the dead as a reward for his obedience. But Jesus is saying all this is in the Old Testament prior to the New Testament being written. Which means you don't need to have the incarnation sufferings of Christ and then go reread and find different intention, a secondary intention in the Old Testament. Which means before the New Testament was written and even before Jesus' earthly ministry, we could say this. That book back there that they, that they call the Law, the Prophets, and the Psalms, it's about the Messiah, ultimately. That's why it exists, because God has a plan of redemption. And this is how he's going to get glory, through the skull-crushing seed of the woman, our Lord Jesus Christ. Thus it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead on the third day, and that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. Jesus says all that's in the Old Testament. Not only the incarnate suffering, the incarnate one suffering, and the incarnate one being raised from the dead on the third day. It's not the band, the third day. But there is, by the way, there's a theology of third day in the Old Testament that's fascinating. And I won't go down that rabbit trail. But Jesus also says this, that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to the nations, beginning from Jerusalem. He says, basically, the gospel, the good news about the incarnate Son of God having suffered and, and entered into his glory is going to start being proclaimed from a city. And he says, that's in the Old Testament. Next time you read the Minor Prophets, look at the doctrine of the remnant around the servant of the Lord, the remnant of believers around the Messiah. Who's... Who's, who do you think the remnant of the Old Testament is? I think it's the apostles and the early Christians in Jerusalem. And from there goes out the law of God, the word of God concerning this gospel. Jesus said all that's in the Old Testament. But in John's gospel, transitioning from Luke, in John's gospel, there, there, John's gospel contains a severe rebuke by Jesus of some Jewish leaders which may illustrate Dr. Gaffin's point above even better than Luke 24. Listen to, to these words by Jesus in John 5. Do not think that I will accuse you before the Father. The one who accuses you is Moses, in whom you have <clears throat> set your hope. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? Now, these words were spoken after Jesus had said, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is these that testify about me. The more inclusive statement of John 5.39 is followed by a specific statement concentrating on the writings of Moses, verses 45 through 47. Now, these texts indicate not only that Jesus viewed the Old Testament as a witness to himself, but that it functioned this way apart from his own self-witness, that is, apart from him saying it. It didn't become true simply because Jesus says, oh, by the way, Moses didn't write about me, but now I'm going to change that. Moses wrote about me. It doesn't change the divine intention in the writings of the Old Testament when Jesus makes this statement. So the Old Testament functioned this way apart from his own self-witness and prior to the completion of what we call the New Testament. I have a, my next sentence says, think about that. So if you're not thinking, uh, start thinking. Think about that. The Old Testament, in other words, was a messianic document on its own, according to our Lord. Here's what Gaffin says on these John 5 texts. Here, Jesus affirms the relative overall clarity and independence of Moses, the Old Testament, as a witness to himself distinct from his own teaching. It didn't take the teaching of Jesus for Moses to write about him. So much is the case that this Old Testament witness to Christ serves 
as an adequate basis for the just condemnation of those rejecting him, John 5, 45, in itself and independent of his own self-witness. Now, these words of our Lord in John 5 illustrate that he viewed the Old Testament as a perspicuous witness to himself. And read in conjunction with Luke 24, the text we read from Luke 24, it seems clear that our Lord viewed the Old Testament as a whole, finding its scope or its goal or its terminus or its target in him. Now, I'm going to assume for the rest of my talk that uh, everyone agrees with that, that Jesus viewed himself as the scope of the Old Testament scripture. And uh, I want to follow it up with a brief discussion about our Lord uh, with a look at some of his early disciples. Um, not only was, was our Lord interpreting the Old Testament this way, uh, obviously the apostles did, but some nameless disciples in the jo- Gospel of John end up being a fascinating illustration of first century believers in Christ as the, uh, as the promised Messiah of the Old Testament interpreting who Christ was in light of the Old Testament in a Christocentric, Christological kind of, kind of way. And you, if you would want to turn to John 2, I'm going to read a passage from John 2 and then explain it. It's John 2, 13 to 22. So the discussion here is going to be very limited in scope. I will not attempt to look at the New Testament use of the Old Testament as proof of Christ as the scope of Scripture, though I think that could be done with much profit. And it would certainly support my thesis. Instead, I want to look briefly at John chapter 2. And in this passage, we'll note that some early disciples give evidence of the concept of Christ as the scope of Scripture. Let me read the text, John 2, 13 to 22. The Passover of the Jews was near. Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And he found in the temple those who were selling oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers seated at their tables. And he made a scourge of cords and drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And to those who were selling the doves, he said, take these things away. Stop making my father's house a place of business. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me, a reference to Psalm 69. See what's happening? That's John's commentary on something the disciples remembered while the incarnate son was doing something in the temple. What did they remember? That written revelation said, zeal for your house will consume me. They were doing biblical interpretation during the incarnate ministry of the Son of God. They were making connections between the acts of the incarnate Son and the prophetic word, Psalm 69. The Jews then said to him, what sign do you, uh, do you, what sign, what sign do you show, show us as your authority for doing these things? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it up. The Jews then said, it took 46 years to build this temple, and you'll raise it up in three days? Here's John's commentary. But he was speaking of the temple of his body. So when he was raised from the dead, this is after the resurrection now. So we're back in the life, earthly ministry of Christ uh, for a while there. And now John's, after the fact, writing about it. After the resurrection of Christ, looking back at that event... He says, so when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that. Okay, notice verse 17, his disciples remembered that. That seems to be at the time of the actions of Christ in the temple. And now his disciples remembered that. This is at the time after the resurrection. They remembered that. He said this, and they believed two things, the scripture and the word which Jesus had spoken. Um. I've preached through this passage, so it's very hard not to go on tons of rabbit trails. So I'm going to just try to stick to the notes here. Uh, We often think of hermeneutics or interpreting the Bible as something we do, which is true. However, if you notice verse 17 and 22 of John 2, something fascinating comes out. 
John 2.17 begins by saying his disciples remembered that it was written. This is John's commentary on the thought process of some of Christ's disciples in the first century prior to the writing of the New Testament. The words, it was written, refer to what was already written at that time. John tells us what was written and what Old Testament text these disciples were thinking about by quoting Psalm 69.9, zeal for your house will consume me. The disciples were interpreting the Old Testament independent of the new during the life of our Lord. John's comment informs us that they started connecting the dots from the Psalms to Jesus while our Lord was on the earth. In other words, their minds were making interpretive or hermeneutical moves while Christ's zeal for God's temple, his father's house, was being manifested. You see what's happening? It's not so much as they're interpreting the Old Testament in light of Christ. To me, it looks more like they're interpreting Christ in light of the Old Testament. As the Word who became flesh manifested Himself among men, those who believed in Him began to interpret uh, Scripture in light of Him or Him in light of Scripture. John 2.22 says, so when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he, had sa- that he said this, and they believed the Scripture and the word which Jesus had spoken. Let's notice a few things. First, notice, note this. Note the time when his disciples remembered that he said this, that is, when he was raised from the dead. So this is a different time of remembering something. The first remembering was during the life and ministry of Christ in this event in the temple. They remembered that the psalm said this. The second remembering is fast forward after the resurrection. His disciples remembered that he said this. That is, when he was raised from the dead. The resurrection, among other things, triggered the memories of these disciples. Notice second, to which this, of he said this, refers. It refers to what Jesus said as recorded in verse 19, where where we read, Destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up. And then notice third, John's comment about what Jesus said. But he was speaking of the temple of his body, verse 21. Then notice fourth, that they believed the Scripture and the word which Jesus had spoken. The Scripture and the word which Jesus had spoken are not one and the same thing. The word which Jesus had spoken is recorded in John 2.19. Destroy this temple and I'll build it up in three days. The Scripture must refer to the Old Testament, the Psalm 69 and elsewhere. The disciples were interpreting the Old Testament not only during the ministry of our Lord, the Psalm 69 reference, but also after his resurrection and prior to the writing of the New Testament, and surely during and after its writing as well. The resurrection became an interpretive event through which the early disciples believed the Scripture and the word which Jesus had spoken. So just as they began connecting the dots during our Lord's life unto death sufferings, John 2, 17. So they continued to connect the dots when he entered into his glory, that is, upon his resurrection. Now, though it is true that we interpret the Bible in our day, it is also true that the early Christians interpreted the Bible of their day, the Hebrew Scriptures, our Old Testament. Some of their interpretations made it into the New Testament. We just looked at one. And this isn't the interpretation of the Old Testament by apostolic, you know, credentialed ap- apostles. This is, these are just nameless disciples. Could have been the twelve, probably was. Um, this interpretation makes it into the New Testament. Though this does not mean that all of their personal interpretations of the Old Testament... <clears throat> 
reflected the divine intention of the ancient text, it does mean that their interpretations recorded in the New Testament and affirmed to be correct by the authors of the New Testament are infallible interpretations. It doesn't make them infallible interpreters, okay? But they're infallible interpretations. They were correct according to the divine intent. They're contained in the New Testament and they're affirm and the ones affirmed by the New Testament uh, writers or speakers. Because there's interpretations of the Old Testament that are contained in the New Testament that the New Testament doesn't affirm as right. Like the Pharisees got the Old Testament wrong a lot of times, right? But these people in John 2 believed the Scripture and the word which Jesus spoke. They connected the zeal that our Lord was expressing in the temple with Psalm 69. By the way, in John two, three, or four times, Psalm 69 is said to be prophetic of our Lord's earthly ministry. Now, it is obvious that interpreters of Scripture today, in one sense, have an advantage over the first century interpreters that we looked at above. We have God's own interpretation of the historical sufferings and glory of Christ, what we identify as the New Testament. These people... They, they couldn't go, wow, I'm watch, watching Jesus in the temple now, and he's doing exactly what John, what my reading in John chapter 2 told me he was going to do this morning. But this morning I had devotions. I read John 2. Then I came down to the temple, and I saw it playing out in action. They couldn't do that, okay? So we can do that, though. We can't go to the temple and see Jesus acting, but we can read the divinely inspired re- account of the sufferings and glory of Christ in our New Testament. They couldn't do that. So we have an advantage in one sense, you know, we have a completed canon. But I think there's a good lesson for us to learn from this discussion. When our Lord Jesus was on this earth, the Spirit of God was causing the disciples of Christ to recall texts of Scripture due to the presence and ministry of Christ. What their musings on the Old Testament contained in the New Testament and affirmed by its writers show us is that the Old Testament points to Christ. The early disciples saw this more and more as they contemplated our Lord in light of the Old Testament. The inspired documents of the New Testament confirmed that they were right. Not only was Jesus Christ the promised one, he was that to which the Old Testament pointed. The early disciples did not reinterpret the Old Testament in light of Christ. They interpreted it as pointing to Christ. That Christ didn't show up, and then they go, wow, this is the promised one. We have to go reinterpret, okay, unless their interpretations were wrong. I mean, what I mean by that reinterpret is attach, fix a second meaning to the, to the Old Testament, It still has its primary meaning or its first meaning, but then now there's a second meaning. meaning. That's not what they did. They interpreted it as pointing to Christ. And our New Testament is God's confirmation that they were right to do so. If it was right for them to do so, then it is right for us to do the same. The Old Testament is not about Christ simply because the New Testament says so. It is about Christ because that was God's intention from the beginning. This is how the early Christians, and this is how our Lord as well, read the Old Testament, which is confirmed in the New Testament. And this is how we ought to as well. Or in the words of of, uh, James M. Hamilton who teaches at Southern Seminary in Louisville, the Bible teaches Christians how the Bible should be read. That's one of those things to memorize, especially if you're a preacher. That'll preach, you know. The Bible teaches Christians how the Bible should be read. Isn't that interesting? These people were reading or interpreting the Bible as it then stood, including our Lord. Let me draw this to a conclusion. An attempt has been made to display that Christ as the scope of Scripture is a concept attested in the Reformed uh, interpretive tradition. It's present in Reformation and post-Reformation Reformed literature. It's clearly illustrated in John Owen and Nehemiah Cox, even though I didn't read the Cox um, quotes. You'll have to trust me. Christ as the scope of Scripture, according to the older Reformed writers, 
is a result of the exegesis of Scripture and the resultant identity of the target of all its parts. So I have sought to display that this concept predates the Reformed confessions and theologians. Indeed, what has been argued is that it was the view of our Lord, the scope of Scripture being the Messiah, it was the, review of, was the view of our Lord Himself. Our Lord Jesus Christ understood His identity, who He was, and His vocation, what He was to do, in light of our Old Testament. And He saw the Old Testament as a collective arrow pointing to Him in His sufferings and glory. It is clear from the writings of the New Testament that the apostles utilized the same hermeneutical principles used by our Lord. I need a Bible. I didn't even bring a Bible. That's terrible. Is this a Bible? Okay. Concerning the salvation that the first century Christians were experiencing, the prophets... Okay, now he's going back in redemptive history. The prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be, uh, to be yours searched. Okay, so we have, we'll just call them Old Testament prophets. That are, they're inquiring, they're searching, they're inquiring carefully, inquiring what person or time, watch this, the Spirit of Christ in them. Okay, First Peter's over here on the Bible timeline, right? He's talking about prophets back here. The Spirit of Christ, this is before the Incarnation, the Spirit of the anointed servant of the Lord, the Messiah had a Spirit who was working in prophets prior to the Incarnation, uh, which is one of the reasons why Protestants, and especially the Reformed, argue that the mediator must be both divine and human, because before his incarnation, there are mediatorial acts being done by his spirit. Here's one of them revealing something to come. Inquiring what person or time the spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. Isn't that interesting? The prophets then had a messianic consciousness. The prophets of Christ had a messianic consciousness of Christ prior to the incarnation of Christ by virtue of the ministry of the Spirit of Christ. It is also clear that the principles which led to the interpretive conclusion that Christ is the scope of the Old Testament predate our Lord. By the way, so far I've just argued for Christ as the scope of the Old Testament, right? Because that was the scriptures they were dealing with and Peter as well. The principles that he utilized were not invented that Christ used. The, the principles that Christ and others used were not invented in the first century and then thrust back upon the Hebrew Scriptures, making them mean something foreign to their original divine intent. Obviously, the prophets knew that whatever they were writing about, it was about somebody in the future that was going to suffer and then enter into glory. They knew that before they read First Peter, which they didn't because they were all dead. The principles were applied in the first century, though they predated the first century. Or in the words of Hamilton, again, on the human level, Jesus learned the interpretive perspective he taught to his disciples from Moses and the prophets. Isn't that interesting? The interpretive principles used by our Lord and the New Testament authors and other figures, apostles and nameless disciples, were not invented to account for Christ. Okay? There's not some uh, hermeneutical revolution going on through Jesus and the apostles. We need to invent a new interpretive grid through which Christ, we can find Christ in the Old Testament so we can justify who He is. That's what the Jews thought the Christians were doing. They were not invented to account for Christ. They were embedded in the Old Testament before Christ, and they led to Him even without Christ. Now, what is more interesting, maybe even perplexing for some, is that Jesus and the authors of the New Testament give ample testimony that the authors of the Old Testament possessed a, messianic or, a future-oriented messianic consciousness reflected in their writings. 1 Peter 1 and 10 through 12 tells us that. The prophets possessed, apart from the New Testament, a future-oriented messianic consciousness. And listen to what Paul does in Acts 2. Um, Acts 6, uh, 26, excuse me. 
Acts 26, I better hurry here, huh? Very interesting when they call Paul to testify before Agrippa here. We're in Acts chapter 26, just verses 22 and 23. To this day, I have had the help that comes from God. And so I stand here testifying both to small and great, saying, saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses said would come to pass. Okay? Paul says, my apostolic ministry is biblical. It's what Moses and the prophets said would come to pass. What, would, what did the Moses and the prophets say would come to pass? Without the presence of new hermeneutical principles revealed by Christ and the apostles, here's what it said, that the Christ must suffer and that by being the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light both to our people and to the Gentiles. You know the, uh, in Romans 1, to the Jew first and then to the Greek? Here it is again. In Acts 26, Paul didn't read Romans and go, oh, right, I said to the Jew first and then to the Greek in Romans 1, so I better repeat that. Where does he say to the Jew first and then to the Greek comes from? The Old Testament, right? Remember I said, next time you read the Minor Prophets, watch for the doctrine of the remnant around the servant. Where do they start? They start with the servant who dies and enters into glory in Jerusalem. Then the message about him goes from Jerusalem out to the Gentiles. But Paul says, hey, what I, what I said was going to, what I am saying took place, Moses and the prophets said it. So, in other words, the New Testament sees the Old Testament as a messianic document on its own terms. The New T Testament recounts for us words from Acts 26, for example, before those words were spoken, before the words were written. And Paul is basically saying, the Old Testament's a messianic document on its own. And the New Testament witnesses to that. So if the New Testament basically says the Old Testament finds as its scope our Lord Jesus Christ, this, therefore, is the divine commentary on the scope of the Old Testament. You can't disagree with it because you're disagreeing with God because the New Testament is God's written word for us, and it says... This is that. Um, and then in the vernacular, if you've got a problem with it, deal with it. Here's what uh, Jim Hamilton says again. From start to finish, the Old Testament is a messianic document written from a messianic perspective to sustain a messianic hope. I think he is right. What Hamilton says of the Old Testament is agreed upon by all Orthodox, uh, most. Evangelicals and Reformed concerning the new, excuse me, what Hamilton says of the Old Testament is agreed upon by, by all Orthodox on reform and reformed concerning the New Testament. That is, let me put words in his mouth. From start to finish, the New Testament is a messianic document written from a messianic perspective to sustain a messianic hope. No one denies that the New Testament it, its scope is the coming ministry, sufferings, and glory of Christ, along with the implications of these events drawn out and applied to the life of the early church. I don't think anybody can read the New Testament and say, whatever the scope of the New Testament is, it can't be Jesus. You see what I'm talking about? Nobody's going to argue that the, New Testament, the scope of the New Testament is not Jesus. But the challenge is this. Not to argue for the scope of the New Testament as Jesus, but our study presents a challenge to view the entirety of Scripture as finding its target or scope as our Lord Jesus Christ. Not just the New Testament, but the Old Testament, and even this. Not just the, Old, the, 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 uh, the New Testament and the Old Testament, because the New Testament tells us that about the Old Testament, but take the New Testament out of the picture, the Old Testament is about Christ. Though it is true that neither testament was intended by God to stand on its own, it's also true that the Old Testament, when it stood on its own, it witnessed to Christ, it contained the saving knowledge of Christ, and the Old Testament produced believers in Christ. Watch this. This isn't, I, that doesn't sound, it sounds like a magician. Watch me pull a rabbit out of my hat. 
This is not a rabbit out of my hat. This is a, a text from the New Testament. It's on 2 Timothy 3.15. We know 3.16 very well, but look at 3, 5, uh, 2 Timothy 3, 3, 3.15. And how from childhood, this is Paul to Timothy, how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings. What would that refer to? The Old Testament. Which sacred writings are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus? Isn't that interesting? Paul tells Timothy, uh, you got trained in the scriptures of the Old Testament and you believed in the Messiah by virtue of the written word of God of the day, which is the Old Testament. The same could be said, excuse me, um, the Old Testament, when it stood on its own, witnessed to Christ contained the saving knowledge of Christ and produced believers in Christ. We could say the same thing about the New Testament, except the New Testament never stood on its own. Since the documents that contained the promise of Christ, the Old Testament, had as their scope the person and office of the Messiah, then certainly the documents that contain the fulfillment in Christ, the New Testament, do the same. Christ, then, here's my conclusion, is the target, the goal, the scope of the Scriptures which give all glory to God. I am finished. I'm sorry it went a little long. Um, and I'm not sure what to do. So when you're not sure what to do, you pray. So I'll pray, and then I'll let uh, the powers that, the Pharisees that be, take over. Lord, we are grateful for the Old and the New Testament. Very, we are very privileged to stand on this side of the, the entrance into glory by the incarnate Son of God for us, for our salvation. We thank you for the documents that interpret the great acts of God for us, uh, creation, our fall in Adam, your plan of redemption in Christ. We pray that all that was said by all the speakers would be uh, blessed, and if anything was said that's not in line with your word, we want that not to be remembered. So we ask your blessings on your word, in Jesus' name.